Hello and welcome to Recovery Survey, the podcast where we survey recovering addicts with different backgrounds and different lengths of clean time and ask them questions about different recovery topics. I'm joined today by a very special guest. He is the founder of Stay Stopped Recovery Apparel. Welcome to the show, Jackson. Hey, Brett, how you guys doing today? My name is Jackson. I am the founder of Stay Stopped United. I formed this organization based on what I believe was a spiritual, divine type of a inspiration, if you will. I want to kind of tell my story. I have a sobriety date of May 8th. 2015. I give all the honor and glory to the grace of God for that date, date that I never, ever, ever expected to do. I wasn't that guy that basically was just like, yeah, I'm so done. You know, my life is so terrible. I was fully functional. You know, I was living that double life. I had a belief in God and I kind of looked at God as more of a judging kind of a God. And I remember over my 20 years and actually trying to get a handle on on this addiction thing. Actually, I should say my last 10 years, because again, I spent 20 years in it, but I think like my last 10 years, I believe God was truly trying to reach me in some type of way. And and based on the spiritual principles that I've uh, adopted since then, honesty seems to have been like the most powerful statement that I believe that kind of really stuck out with me in the formation of my organization called Stay Stop. I formed it as the official self-proclaimed, if you will, official recovery apparel brand. A lot of t-shirts company out there. A lot of guys like to have fun with the t-shirt thing. Stay Stop was a thing that came to me back in 2013. I was at a rehab and basically I just had to get the heat off. I had a family situation with my daughter's mother. Things were getting kind of heated, and I was not an honest person in any way, shape, or form. I maintained a whole life of of dishonesty because, again, I had to live a double life. There's no way I could reveal, like, that dark side that I was in the grips of. I found myself at a rehab out in San Diego, 2013, and one of the facilitators, he was talking, and I was, you know, the whole deal was I'm going to this rehab. 30 days and that would you know appease my daughter's mother and you know i'd get right back to again kept that reservation i wasn't honest about it from the beginning but again i knew i had a drug problem but again my honesty was the furthest from it you know i mean my willingness even more so was even the furthest from trying to stop what i did know is i wanted to control it you guys but again i there's no way i was ever gonna stop this rehab out in San Diego, VVSD, was Veterans Village of San Diego. Yes, I am a, a U.S. Army veteran. Very proud of that as well. The facilitator, he was kind of just randomly talking. And he said to the whole group, he was like, you know, drug addicts and alcoholics, they stop all the time. They just don't know how to stay stopped. And when he said that, I just felt something inside of me. And again, I take it today as a spiritual message, a spiritual little experience that I basically had at that moment right there. Cause I, my, I remember my head popped up and I was like, stay stopped. And, and I remember just kind of jotting it down on my little notebook paper, stay stopped. And, and I would go to that rehab and I would, you know, excel. And I was like really into it. I was really going to, you know, stop this time. And it actually had changed my whole perspective of using. And I was like, okay, I'm going to really give this a chance this time. I'm going to really try to to do this, but I didn't want to incorporate God, even though I knew it was a God shot, if you will. I knew that, ah, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to be able to do this. So I went the 30 days and that 30 days turned into 90 days. And again, I'm really getting into this recovery thing at this last rehab. 90 days turned into five months. At that five month mark, I was like, okay, look, I'm ready to come home now. I'm going to do meetings. I'm going to, you know, stay on this path. And again, it was dishonest. My willingness, once again, another spiritual principle was nowhere to be found. I knew in the back of my mind that I just needed to control it a lot better. And I came across as I had willingness. I faked my willingness, dishonest. I was very dishonest because about a month after I got home from that rehab, I was back at the Connect's house. It was a, such a weird moment because I remember going to my connects. It was a female. She was, you know, kicking it. 
and she says, oh, my God, Jackson, where you been? We haven't seen you in so long, and you look great, and da-da-da. I said, yeah, I've been in rehab, and, you know, I've been doing this, you know, recovery thing. I've been trying to stay sober. You know, it's been six months. It's not me, man. I said, I tried it. I'm over it. This was like my best state of mind was I tried it and it didn't work for me. Again, what I didn't do is I didn't realize even at that time that I had that spiritual thing, I actually still was able to push God to the side one more time. Because even though I knew he had sent that message to me to stay stopped, I still felt like, ugh, it's just not me. I'm not, I can't do it. So I decided to go ahead and get loaded again. And I would stay out this time for two years. Again, it was just, it, it had gotten progressively worse. Every attempt to control it was getting worse and worse. I locked myself in the bathroom hours on end, you know, and at this time, me trying to conceal it was completely out the door. Trying to stay stopped was completely off the table. But at the same time, I knew there was something spiritual going on inside of me. I felt like there was this pull between the evil side and the spiritual side, and I could feel it. And I just knew there was something pulling. Either way, long story short, May 8th, actually May 7th, I should say, I went out one more time to go to the Connects and hang out and party. You know, the kids were in bed. Daughter's mother, she's, you know, stressing me out and everything. And I took off, came back home the morning of May 8th, 2015. And a little heated argument started. It just got really crazy in there. I remember throwing my, my daughter's mother on the bed grabbed the pillow, tried to smother. I tried to choke her out altogether. I, I wanted her to just stop with all the nagging and everything. And my daughter came walking in the door and she says, daddy, stop. And she's the way she screamed that, oh my God, it was just such a piercing sound. And I remember standing up and I said, I can't control myself, but I don't care if I go to the blackest of hell. Boom. I stopped. I went back to my computer and I just sat down. And the whole family was just like, what the heck just happened here? About a half hour later, the kids, everyone left for school and to go to work. And or so I thought 45 minutes later, my phone rang. And it was Orange County Sheriff's Department and said, oh, Mr. Jackson, can you go and step outside. We had a couple of officers there. They will just want to talk to you. If you could just step outside. And I was like, oh, boy, here we go. He's going to try to set me up. With, with some dope or whatever, but I don't have no dope on me, so whatever. And again, I completely was oblivious to the whole concept and idea that I just inflicted domestic battery. They went ahead and took me into custody. You're being arrested for domestic battery, child abuse, child endangerment, because I did it in front of the kids. And again, my whole freaking world just stopped. I just remember sitting there just pouring in tears, I was speechless. I couldn't even talk. I just felt like my whole world had just been just shattered. I felt betrayed by my family. I felt like I was completely lost. As they were booking me into custody, they said, are you suicidal or are you homicidal? You know, or what's going on with you? And I kind of just, again, just busted out in, in tears again. I couldn't even talk. And they said, just go ahead and have a seat. They took me to a mental psych evaluation. They ended up putting me in the psych ward for evaluation. I just want to kind of speed this up a little bit because I'm in custody, psych ward, boom. The H&I people, I don't know if you guys heard of H&I, but H&I is the hospitals and institutions from the AA program. They came into the jails. They, I'm about 22 days in at this point. They said, here's a big book. If you want to come out and join us, we're having a little big book reading, if you can read it. I kind of just randomly took the book, thumbed through the pages, and my thumb caught page 553. Never touched the AA big book in my life, ever. I looked at the heading of it, and the title was AA Taught Him How to Handle Sobriety. And there was a little sub-narrative on the top. It said, God willing, we'll never have to deal with drinking again, but we have to deal with sobriety every day. I was like, whoa, that's, that's deep right there. And I was just like, okay. So I kind of finger scanned it a little bit down, first paragraph. Another, another paragraph caught my eye again. Said I did quit drinking once for 10 months on my own, once when I was hospitalized. I said, there's no great trick to stop drinking. The trick is to stay stopped. At that moment right there, I, I looked at two things. And first thing I looked at is, why is the word stay stopped italicized? 
normal books that you know are just written regular. I said, why is stay stop? Why is that italicized? And I was like, what the heck? And I closed the book real slow and I said, okay, God, I don't know where that came from, but all I knew is I knew that was him talking to me through that book right there. In terms of honesty, I had no idea about any type of spiritual principles. Okay, but as I reflect right now, to kind of tie this all in together. It was at that moment where I had to really get honest with myself. And I'd never heard that phrase or understood the phrase stay stopped or get honest with yourself, you know, but I would later learn the honesty with myself. You know, I can be honest with you. I can be honest with, you know, people around me, people I work with. I can be pretty, you know, legit, honest person. But when it comes to myself, I could never be honest with myself. And the reason I couldn't be honest with myself is because I never really understood that whole concept and the whole principle of how my mind can tell me that, okay, you can control it better this time. I always bought into that that illusion and that delusion. So Stay Stopped kind of resonated with me. When I saw it, I closed the book and I said, okay, God. And then I opened the book back up and I was like, you know, but I don't know how to do this. And the very next paragraph, it said to do that, I had come to AA to learn how to handle sobriety, which is what I couldn't handle in the first place. That's why I drank. So again, more honesty. And I was like, yeah, you know what? That is what's happening over here. I can't handle sobriety. I can handle for a little bit, for a couple of days, for a couple months, but I just can't handle it. What I learned quickly in this program is that this God factor, and it's kind of cool because in doing the steps, it's like it gets right to it right from the start. Honesty, principle, step number one. Honest with who? Myself, okay? I get that, okay? If I can be honest with myself, then I'm going to really be honest with you, with you. So I went from that part to immediately that second step, which wastes no time in activating the fact that step number one, my best efforts and my all my reservations, it wasn't sufficient. And then I come into step number two, where I learned the principle of, of hope, where it said, I came to believe that a power. I had my ideas of God, but it was just like, I don't know, this guy, I've, I've prayed and I've said, help me before. And I've prayed, you know, that jailhouse prayer, get me out of here. And I've always had this certain idea that I know God's around, but he just, he just isn't helping me. He's just not doing it. I kind of had to take a step back and I realized that that humility all of a sudden came to be a, a factor. Now, humility, of course, is, is not until the seventh step. Part of my story is, is to make sure that I am acknowledge two things. Number one. I got to be honest with myself and I'm an alcoholic. That's a, that's the first part. And I never wanted to acknowledge that because again, I can control this for 20 years. I was in it for my first 10 years, had no interest whatsoever to stop my last 10 years. I was really trying to control it a little bit better. So I first thing I had to come to terms with is the honesty principle, a spiritual principle to the fact that my own best power was not sufficient. And that was a game changer for me because again, I'm a pretty strong-willed individual. You know, I'm a vet born and raised in Jersey. You know what I mean? I can handle the streets. I can handle it out here. I'll stop when I want to stop. It was always my state of mind. It, yeah, it gets a little bit carried away sometimes, but I didn't understand the extent that I was losing my own identity and I was losing my own self. I'm grateful for a program that kind of allowed me to get connected to a higher power, which I choose to call God. But again, I like to make it clear that God is a significant part of Stay Stop as an organization of Jackson as I continue to carry a message of hope. And the reason I feel so strongly about it is there's a lot of people out there that are just like me. And again, it's my hope that, you know, there's these kids are coming in here, you know, two, three, four years into it, and they're like already beat down. I'm like, I was just starting it five, six years. You know, I mean, it was really getting going. It took me 10 years before I even even considered it. So, again, I just believe I have a really strong message of hope to bring to people because staying stop and being honest and having a sense of humility to actually say, I can't control it. I can't control myself. That was such a huge part in my recovery. And to bring a brand to the community, I said, you know what, stay stopped. I believe that God said, look, Jackson, this is the message that you're going to carry. And being able to stay stopped, it has conditions attached to it. The first condition, of course, I got to be honest. 
I got to understand that in order to stay stopped, it is by a power greater than myself on a daily basis that I get to practice this stuff. And I wanted it to be a brand, a clothing brand, because I wanted that label. And I remember seeing Dickies, you know, the Dickies label, you know, that big red tag. And I thought that was like, like the coolest looking deal. And then the bands, you know, everyone's rocking the bands. So I was like, you know, they got skateboarder brands and they got construction and, and working, you know, working class brands and they got Billabong and Hurley and surfboard brands. I'm like, we're in recovery for the rest of our lives. I said, I want to make this a spiritual brand that really kind of resonates throughout the community so that when people see one of our signature t-shirts is the stay humble. When a person sees stay humble or they see that label on that left sleeve shoulder and they see, hey, stay stopped. They're going to say, oh, that's some real recovery right there. Because again, I, I don't want to say that I wanted to separate myself from other t-shirt companies out there because I get it, man. They're trying to have fun with it. They're trying to bring a nice little fun, humorous side to sobriety per se. But Stay Stopped is not that brand. Stay Stopped wants to bring a, a real, genuine, authentic experience to people in recovery. This is not fun and games, but at the same time, it is a fun thing to be able to get honest with yourself and to be a productive member of society and to be taken seriously. I don't, I don't really like to represent Stay Stopped in profanity. I try not to practice profanity like I used to. You know what I mean? That's a big thing for me. I like to always make sure that I give credit to God and you know make it clear that the sobriety I have is only by the grace of God. Every day that I continue my spiritual maintenance and, you know, practice these principles, that's why I wanted to get in touch with, you know, that recovery survey, you guys over there, because I say, hey, this is an opportunity to really get our message out there. You guys are bringing spiritual principles to the forefront, and it's significant that people understand in recovery, it's not about trying to be your, your same personality and your same attitude. There's a real live personality change that has to be taken into effect right now. And when I saw Recovery Survey, I really felt strongly about connecting with you guys. I understand you're just beginning and everything, because again, I want to bring this message of recovery to the people, to the community, to the youngsters that are out there that are just kind of, like I said, two, three years in recovery. Being a clothing brand, I said, you know what, it's a thing. You know, your clothes, you know, your brands, that's how people will identify us. It's a weird thing, whatever you want to call it, but people look at the brands that people wear. But again, the message is stay stopped. The message is wear recovery, live recovery. And I feel like every opportunity I get to get on a podcast to kind of share my story, I'm hoping that people will get to know me better so that they can have their own personal experience with their own personal recovery and finding, you know, the God of their understanding. I just had a few questions about the company. When did you start it? You kind of went into the backstory of the name and, and that was really cool to see how the name is tied to your story. Basically, after I was released in, from custody, I went right into a rehab. It was a court order deal. They were going to suspend the domestic battery charge and all my other charges. But I had to complete a 18 month treatment program. It kind of went on for like three years because I was a little bit resistant to it. But in that 18 months, I left custody, uh, went to the VA, and they kind of evaluated me again. And I got my diagnosis with, you know, the substance use disorder. I got a, a diagnosis with the PTSD, a diagnosis with major depression, diagnosis anxiety, all these diagnoses. Then from there, they shipped me off to rehab. And in rehab, again, I would continue pursuing the program of recovery, which was through Alcoholics Anonymous. In that time, I sat in rehab. I said, you know, I, I want to create something. I used the time to develop a business model. The business model was, again, like I said, I, I want to make it a clothing brand. And my whole first year, I spent really just getting the brand name out there. Again, I wanted to just use the time, you know, rehab to really kind of just bring the brand to the forefront. But again, had no idea, had no background in any type of business, whatever. I was an insurance agent prior to that. But again, I just saw an opportunity right there. I said, I'm going to make this a business. The director there, he said, Jackson, you know, you got to sell recovery. Yeah, I said, that's, that's what we got to do. People have to be attracted to recovery. 
So I said, I want our brand to create that sense of attraction. And I ran across deal where traditions and they were like, you know, this is promotion or attraction, not promotion. And then I was like, wait a second, I'm not promoting Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I'm trying to bring attraction to recovery as a whole. So again, I wanted to continue to pursue a brand that would actually build a business model that would create a sense of attraction to other people in in treatment or, you know, trying to do this recovery thing, you know, whether they were ready or not, because again, I was not ready, but something happened when I heard that stay stopped. And it was just like every single person that's in rehab, that's, you know, trying to detox, every single one of them has sworn off drugs and alcohol. I'm done. I'm never doing it again. And they go right back. So again, I felt it was such a significant brand name. And I felt like I got to make this model click and I have to make this something that will attract people to come into recovery because I didn't want recovery to just be meetings and rehab. You know, meetings are cool and all, but again, when we're out there in society, we're trying to get back into the flow of life. I work with soldier suicide organizations. I work with, you know, work with veterans over at the VA. You know, I deal with other organizations outside of there and I run into a lot of people. And when I see guys with a stay humble or stay stop shirt, it's like an instant connection. And that's exactly what I wanted to create. I wanted our brand to create that sense of connection within the community. When you're just out there at the grocery store or at the car wash or at the swap meet, whatever, if you see one of us wearing that brand, it's an instamatic attraction. You're going to high five or pound, you know, give that dude a, a knuckle bump instantly. There's going to be a connection there. And that's basically what I wanted our brand to connect, not just a t-shirt. Oh, that guy's wearing a t-shirt that says sober AF. You know, it's more than being sober. And that's kind of what I wanted to really make our business model about. Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to go ahead and let us know the website and what kind of products you have for sale and stuff for people that, that aren't familiar with your brand? Absolutely. So basically, we have an awesome website that kind of gives a story of our organization at staystopunited.org, which basically just gives a rundown overview of our mission, of our vision. And then there's the actual store, our shop, which is staystopped.shop. Again, we have awesome t-shirts. We use a premium quality, heavyweight pro club t-shirt. If you want a lighter weight t-shirt, we have an awesome next level tri-blend. Again, we wanted to make sure our materials and our actual t-shirts were going to be a great brand. We have some awesome hoodies. And another thing I like to bring, the fact that we offer a wholesale type of a plan to treatment centers that are trying to do fundraisers. We created this brand also, you know, to help other organizations raise funds. We we're like, hey, you know, they're selling cookies and candies to raise funds. No, oh, here's a, you know, a recovery apparel brand where, you know, we can really kind of help it in that perspective too. So we have programs available for treatment centers or detoxes or, or whatever your organization is. If you wanted to, you know, buy by the dozen, that option is available too. We have awesome shower curtains, tennis shoes. We got some awesome tennis shoes. This is all on our staystop.shop website. But what I'd like to invite all the listeners to is check out our Instagram. Our Instagram is really cool. It's basically just stay.stop. And again, it's awesome, awesome stuff. We do a lot of inspirational posts there. We do a lot of our merchandise is shown on there as well. I'm right there, person to person. I got myself and two other gentlemen two other vets that i work with that we basically help keep this organization going we ship nationwide all over but i just appreciate the opportunity brett thank you so much thanks for sharing your journey with us and letting us know about your company i received my stay humble shirt a couple days ago and i have to say it's an excellent quality and it looks awesome thanks jackson Thanks again for listening to Recovery Survey. If you enjoyed the episode, please consider leaving us a rating or a review, and please be sure to tell your friends about us. If you'd like to get in contact with us, we have a brand new website. It's recoverysurvey.com. Until next time, I've been your host, Brett. Thanks for listening.